Today with Joseph Prince. The world is hating towards judgment. The king is going to return to set this world right. And there will be a millennium rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached once, once again, all right, before he comes. Then when he comes, that kingdom will be established because finally, it's no more an absentee kingdom. The king, kingdom is the king. There's a king. The king is here. This revelation of the end times will cause people to walk with God. Are y'all doing? Ready for God's Word? Always remember that God's Word is God-breathed. You might not like the structure or this story, or, or what, but whatever is designed is designed by the breath of God. Amen? Uh, secretaries, God's secretaries are the authors like Moses, like Paul. They are just God, God filled, God breathed on them, and they write. Paul's letters are different from Peter's letters. Peter's letters are different from Matthew. Matthew is different from Mark. God uses human personality. Just like God uses human personalities in preaching as well. God does not bypass human personality. But it is very beautiful that when God's Spirit breathes on the human personality, the words that come out is the expression of God Himself. Now, there, there are teachings that say that the ideas are inspired, but the words are not. It's just the idea. Now, that is error. Every scripture is God breathed. In fact, Paul, Paul makes an argument in uh, Galatians when he says, just from one word, God said to Abraham in the Old Testament, God said, in your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Paul sees upon it, the fact that the word seed does not have S, it's singular. He argues for the fact that this seed is Christ Himself, that in Him alone, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, just based on one letter. Amen? So we, I, I have a sermon on this that I did some time back. You can ask the counter for it. But uh, it's important that you understand in the plenary inspiration of Scripture. Every word is inspired. Now, when I say that, I mean the original uh, Scripture. Every word is inspired. That does not mean that, that uh, there are certain expressions that the translators put in to help you understand. Sometimes it's more of a hindrance, like uh, some of the new translations, new versions. The Greek and the Hebrew of the old is word for word inspired. But man, when man tries to improve on it, it's, con, you know, it's, it's translated into Chinese, into, into uh, Japanese, into uh, uh, different languages, Spanish, or even the, the King James. There are certain expressions you find in italics that is supposed to help you understand. That means it's not in the original. Sometimes it hinders. So keep that in mind. All scripture in its original state is inspired. But we take advantage of all the helps we have we compare the new versions and what it says about this verse. That's perfectly all right. Amen? You ready for God's Word? Let's dive right into it. Last week, we started with Genesis 18 and how the Lord, such a homely picture in Genesis 18, that God would come to a man's home. Amen? Share the secrets of his heart. Eat with a man. Amen? And God brought two angels with him. We know it's the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But what a homely Beautiful, comfortable, restful picture. God at home with His people. Isn't that beautiful? And we saw that uh, Abraham instantly knew his divine visitor. He need not like Joshua, when he saw the man with the drawn sword, he had to inquire who he was. Are you on our side? Or are you on the other, the other side side? You know, he had to inquire. Gideon had to inquire. At first, he didn't know the divine visitor. Many of them, they had to inquire, but Abraham, may we all be like him. Instantly, he knew who that divine visitor was. The Bible says he was, he was nearly 100 years old, but we saw last week, he ran. A 100-year-old man running. Whenever your eye is on the Lord, you run. Amen. Amen. Your body will not know it's old. Your body will only know it's maker and it's redeemer. Amen. 
Are you struggling spiritually or exhausted from trying to be a perfect Christian? Will you let us bless you with a copy of Joseph's foundational book, Destined to Reign, today? Find out why your Christian walk is not about what you can do for God, but what He has already done for you. Request your free copy of Destined to Reign by visiting josephprince.org new or texting new to 71239 today. Offer available to U.S. residents only. When there was a storm and Jesus was walking on the storm, remember, to the boat where the disciples were, in jeopardy, in fear, in great consternation, Peter, looking at Jesus, said, bid me come. And Jesus knew that Peter's eyes was on him. Jesus says, come. And Peter did the supernatural. As long as his eye is on Jesus. Of course, he took his eyes off for a while and he started becoming natural. So the greatest superhero, I told my son the other day, the greatest superhero in the whole universe is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the greatest superhero. The one who died. I mean, he's greater than any romantic drama. The one who gave his life for the woman that he loved. You and I. And now we are his bride waiting for the wedding day. Isn't it romantic? I mean, don't, don't make it dry, orthodoxy and theology. The whole thing is beautiful. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. His Son didn't have to come and gave His life for us. So we see in Genesis 18 a, a, a family picture, a picture of how God wants our families to be like. God present, amen. God sitting, eating with us, amen. The unseen guests, divine guests. And then He revealed His heart. I just want to call your attention to the fact that I mentioned last week that the Jewish people today, they don't mix dairy products, they call it kashrut loss, with meat. Now, that's their rabbinical law, okay? But here we see Abraham giving meat, a young calf, and also yogurt, butter and cheese. So definitely uh, uh, in the scriptures, it seems all right, okay? But there was a death. Young calf had to die. Just when the prodigal son came home, the young calf had to die. It's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blood had to be shed for that reconciliation. Because God is a holy God. Amen? God is a holy God. And uh, we must never forget that God being holy, God has to judge. Today, my sermon is understanding this part of God's uh, nature. I, 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 I take great... Um, you know, I, I say this with great trepidation because I, I don't want you to go, be, uh, go home with the wrong impression or the wrong idea of God because there's a lot of teachings already. People, you know, in the movies that pr they, are, they produce on uh, the book of Genesis and judgment is always the perspective. Judgment is always the focus, all right? God's anger is always the emphasis. So for me, I want to be careful. Is that judgment? Yes. A pastor, God is love. God, what God is? His love. Who God is, He is God. And because He is God, He has to judge. There's no one above Him to judge. He doesn't judge. There'll be the end of mankind. There'll come a time, all right, sin will be rampant and man will be no more. They'll destroy themselves. God has to judge. But I want to tell you one thing. God's nature is not to judge. In Micah 6, 8, God says, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justice. Say to do justice. To love mercy. Say love mercy. And to walk humbly. Say walk humbly with God. So three things. God says do justice, love mercy. And it's an advice especially to leaders of God's people. God says sometimes you have to do justice. This is a word to all the magistrates, to all the judges, to all the, the people that have to execute justice. So the thing is this, they have to judge. But as judges, when, even when you judge, you should never love judgment. That's what God says in Micah. Do justice, but love mercy. Your heart loves mercy. And the word mercy, there's grace, chesed, which is translated by Delich, the Hebrew scholar, as grace. Love grace, but do justice. Sometimes we do that for your children. Amen? We discipline them. We do justice, but we love mercy. And how fast we are to run to them, so to speak. The moment their heart is soft, you know, they've learned their lesson. Amen. How fast we are, right? Talking about normal parents. Amen. 
So God wants you to love mercy. But there, there, there are Christians, some sentimental Christians who love mercy and also do mercy. That's not God's way. Sometimes you have to do justice. Amen. Your children want you to stop them. Give them boundaries. They want you to parent them. Amen. They don't want you to be their best friend. They want you to be their father, their mother. Amen. Friendship comes later. And please, don't rob them. They are not orphans. Amen. So here we have God coming to the house and God revealing the secrets of His heart to Abraham and Sarah, saying that this time next year, Sarah will have a son. That's been their dream all this while. What a beautiful picture. God eats, God celebrates with them. And then God gives this wonderful news. Amen. It was such a beautiful, warm, intimate surrounding. You know, I'll tell you something. Twelve disciples walked with Jesus. They were familiar with Him, but few were intimate with His mind, the counsels of His heart. Doesn't mean you walk with Jesus and you're familiar with Him, that you, you, you commune with Him. Communion and familiarity are two different things. Intimacy and familiarity are two different things. The centurion never walked with Jesus, the one in Capernaum. He told Jesus, I know who you are. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Because I have servants under me. He didn't even spend walking around Galilee with Jesus. He just met Jesus. But there was that revelation of the Holy Spirit to see who Jesus was. The disciples were lacking. But they were familiar but not intimate. This centurion was intimate with his thoughts. And it pleased Jesus. Jesus was so happy. All right, we see another one, the Syrophoenician woman. We see glimpses of people. Zacchaeus, they look right be, uh, through the veneer of the flesh of our Lord Jesus and saw the God of love and grace. Amen. And that's why they persevere. And they know that He will grant them. Amen. Are you listening, people? May you all have eyes. And me also. May, may we all have eyes to see and a heart to hear. We just don't want to be familiar with the Bible. Look at all those portions, but we are not intimate with the thoughts of the Holy Spirit in that passage. Are you listening? And then they got up after they ate and they walked as if they were going, going towards the plains of Jordan. We'll continue our story from here. Amen. And Abraham walked them there. And by the way, they were laughing, right? I mean, Abraham was laughing. Most likely Abraham was laughing also. But Sarah was laughing when she heard that she would have a son at 90 years old. She started laughing. Shall I have pleasure? We covered all that last week. Amen. And the Lord says, uh, did I hear Sarah laugh? She said, no. In the tent. No, I heard you laugh. So when the boy was born, they called his name Laughter. Ishak. So here they were. They were about to go to the plains of Jordan and, 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 and Abraham walked with his divine guest. And the two men, which are two angels. The Bible says angels can turn into a form of a man. I heard uh, last uh, week uh, as we were, I was talking with... Uh, uh, Pastor Darren, Pastor Darren was telling me when he was in Perth, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not so nice to drive at night because they don't have like street lamps and all that. So he says that he was caught, I think somewhere having dinner or whatever and, and, and darkness fell real fast, all right? And um, Singaporeans are not used to it, right? <laughs> so he says the road is, is pitch dark. And as he drove, he was kind of hoping that he can see his way around, all right? He know his way back to his uh, cottage or wherever he was staying. And lo and behold, a truck came through with bright lights shining way down the road. And all he did was that he followed the truck. And the truck brought him home. Now, I've heard many, many times. Now, I'm not saying it's an angel, but it very well, very well could be. Many of you have this kind of experiences. I don't want to give a spectacular experience because you might not identify. This kind of experiences when you're about to cross the road and you don't see anything Right, you just happen to cross and you feel something pull you back, like a wind. And then, boom, there's a motorcycle that just came from nowhere. How do you explain that? Who pulled you back? These are simple things that we take for granted. But the Bible says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unaware. So if you see them wearing a coat and their coat is high, right? You know it's an angel, what? <laughs> right? 
So they don't appear like that. They appear like a man. So the Bible says, even when, when Abraham was talking to the Lord, the Bible says, the two men went toward Sodom. So let's follow the story now. And the Lord said, because the outcry, all right, the men went, the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then a the man turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. So the two angels went toward Sodom as if they knew the mind of the Lord and they both straight away went. So the two of them went. And Abraham was on a higher plane. Hebron is higher, but from Hebron, a distance down, you can see the Dead Sea and you can see the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. Remember when Lot, his nephew, uh, was given the choice because they are, they are shepherds, all right, and caretakers were fighting among each other. And Abraham says, no, it's not nice for us to fight. There are Hittites and parasites in the land. You take the right. If you take the right, I'll take the left. You take the left, I'll take the right. What a humble man Abraham is. And the Bible says that Lot saw the beautiful, beautiful, fertile crescent of the uh, uh, Jordan Valley. It was lush. It was green. It's not like today, the Dead Sea area. It was green. There were rivers running. The Bible says like the Garden of Eden. Looks like Garden of Eden. So he's a man that went by sight, Lot. And he chose by sight. Later on, when enemies came to uh, invade and plunder the land, it was Abraham that rescued him. And after Abraham rescued him, tied to, uh, tied to Melchizedek and all that, and there's no record that Lot ever tied. Lot went back to the city of destruction. So this is something very interesting, all right? I want to tell you something about what the Scripture says. But before we go on reading, I want you to go to Genesis, uh, sorry, 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. If we have 2 Peter 2, yeah. And turning the cities of, this is New Testament now. And turning, God turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Condemn them to destruction. Making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Next. And delivered righteous Lord. Underline that. Righteous Lord. So Lord was righteous. Today I'm going to share with you about a defeated righteous man. A man who had a family and lost his family. He finally ended up with only two daughters, but it was, it's not a proper relationship. A man who was called righteous, but defeated. Abraham is righteous, but Abraham was exalted when all the destruction was happening. He was on a mountain looking down. I said, looking down. The world is hating towards judgment. The king is going to return to set this world right. And there will be a millennium rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached once, once again, all right, before he comes. Then when he comes, that kingdom will be established because finally, it's no more an absentee kingdom. The king, kingdom is the king. There's a king. The king is here. And the Bible says his scepter is a scepter of righteousness. He will, he will judge for the poor. Amen. And God's going to send my son. Okay, my son will rule the, the return of the king. This is the return of the king. And when the king returns after seven years of what Daniel prophesied, amen, the, seven, the, the 70th week, week of Daniel, the last part is to be fulfilled, will happen in the three and a half years of great tribulation. All right, Jesus will come back at the end of that great tribulation. Israel will look up and they'll see him return. He will save Israel. Amen. And he will establish his rule from Jerusalem. The Bible says that. And then there are scoffers that come in these last days saying, where, where, where is the promise that's coming? We hear people preaching on end times and days. And Today, slowly, slowly, you find that the preaching of end times is now put on the shelf or even totally cast out. The Bible says, Peter says, in the end times, scoffers will come saying, where's the promise of his coming? Where, where, where? Since our fathers fell asleep, everything has gone as normal. And the Bible says, these people are ignorant of one thing. Okay, this is what the portion says in chapter 3. Next chapter, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. His promise to return. He's not slack. He's not, he's not slacking concerning the promise of His return. To save us. It, before the return of Christ, let me explain. I, I'm going to say this one more time. I've said this a number of times. The rapture is not second coming. Rapture is a private affair for His church. 
All right? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the rapture. First Thessalonians talks about, all right, the Lord will come and harpazo in Greek. He will seize us. It's a story all over again of Enoch. Enoch never saw death. Enoch was raptured. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. And God said, flood is coming. And I want to, I want to, I want to say something to you. God is not a God that jumps on the gun straight away. Oh, you say, and I'm going to blast you. No, God waited. God waited. God is not slack concerning His promise. As some count slackness, His long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. Not willing. He's not willing. He's not willing. Are, are there those who perish? Yes. But God, on, in God's heart, He's not willing. Then why don't He save them, Pastor Prince? Free choice. Man was not a robot, was not created a robot. God gave man a choice. You can get up right now and walk away. God won't stop you. Jesus said, how I wish Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to gather you as a mother hen would gather her chicks. But notice the four words, but you would not. Would. It's a choice. And now you're left to yourself and armies will come around you. And that happened. We know it happened. So God is not slack, okay? But He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why is God delaying? He's waiting for more to be saved. Amen. Good God. Don't despise His slackness. Don't despise His slackness. And I see a story in the Bible of a terrorist. And what did God do? God knocked him off his high horse, literally, and saved him and made him the greatest apostle of grace that the world has ever seen. The Apostle Paul. I thank God for that. God doesn't deal the way men, you know. What a heart. So Enoch, realize God told Enoch, judgment is coming. You'll find Enoch's prophecy in the New Testament in the book of Jude. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints, saints to judge the ungodliness of the ungodly, of the ungodly speeches they have spoken against him. All right? And Enoch saw it. And God says, Enoch, judgment is coming. Enoch says, God, I'm ready. The flood is coming to the earth. I am ready. And God says, you will have a son. Say, yes. Thank you, Lord. But God says, I want you to name him. Mutusala. Indian name. Mutu, Mutusala. Okay. You, it's Mutusala. Okay. But actually in Hebrew, Mut. Mut is death. So Mutusala. You call his name Mutusala. Say, Lord, what, what do you mean? He's deaf. When he dies, he will bring like an arrow. His death will bring. What does it mean? What does it mean, Lord? Then as the boy grew up, he noticed that God kept the boy strong and healthy. And the boy lived and lived and lived. And Enoch, the Bible says, Enoch had a revelation, by the way. When he was born, he had a revelation already. Because the Bible says, after Methuselah was born, Enoch walked with God. So this revelation of the end times will cause people to walk with God. And his name means what? When he dies, he will come. That means the moment this boy dies, the judgment, the flood will come. And they watch. And the news was spread far and wide. Watch this boy. Every time he has a sneeze and all that, all the neighbors come running with their handkerchief. <laughs> and their chicken soup. And every family have their own chicken soup. Every time, you know, the boy, they will help the boy up. I mean, they, they, they don't want to see him die. And he became the longest living man to record on earth. He lived longer than Adam. Methuselah lived 969 years. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God, people. That's the heart of God. God says, yeah, it's going to happen. Yes, yes, the iniquity is full. It's going to happen. Your boy will be called. When he dies, he will come. Then God waited. <laughs> what a heart. That's why it's called long suffering. I like the old English, long suffering. Every marriage must have this long suffering. Some of you suffer for a while, you whack. You let fly some words. 
long suffering. The first characteristic of love. Love is, the modern says patience, but the word long suffering. I love it. I love it. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Joseph Prince Ministries. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to receive all our latest videos. And join us this Sunday for church on Grace Revolution Church Online. 